Hey guys, Biobeam here. So today we're going to be talking about viruses generally, and then we're going to be talking a little bit about HIV and using HIV as an example to explain evolution by natural selection. So let's get started. So viruses are everywhere. They're on surfaces, they're inside you. Some viruses make you sick, like COVID, like the cold and the flu, those are all viruses. Um, but there are many viruses that exist inside you right now that are not hopefully actively making you sick. So when we look at the evolutionary tree of life, we see we have eukaryota, bacteria, and archaea. So viruses don't really fall anywhere within this evolutionary tree of life. The reason for that is because we don't really consider viruses to be alive. So why is that? The first reason that viruses aren't considered alive is because they aren't made up of cells. They don't contain cells, they aren't a single cell, um, and they don't have any organelles. They don't have any of the normal things that we would, a cell would need or a thing would need to stay alive. They can't produce energy with their mitochondria. Um, they don't have a nucleus. There, there's a variety of things that, that they do not have. So the second thing that why we don't consider viruses to be alive is that they don't have a membrane. So since they're not made up of cells, they also don't have a membrane. They don't have that standard phospholipid bilayer membrane that we are used to in an animal cell. Um, and because they don't have any membrane, they're not able to uptake um, energy and things like that. So one of the other reasons why they're not considered alive. So the third and major reason why viruses aren't considered alive is because they are obligate parasites. A parasite is something that uses the resources and nutrients of another organism in order to live. And obligate means that it must do that. So there is no other way for a virus to live except as a parasite. It can only live on surfaces like a countertop or cardboard for a very, very short period of time without a host presence. We consider them obligate parasites. So for these three reasons, they have no cells or organelles, they don't have any membrane, and because they're obligate parasites is why we do not consider viruses to be alive. So we just learned about what viruses aren't and why they aren't alive. So let's kind of dig into what viruses are, what makes up a virus. So viruses generally are made up of two main things. The first one being a protein coat. When you think of a protein coat, you can think of something like your hair or your nails, which are entirely made up of protein, which act as a protective surface. So that entire outer exterior of a virus is made up entirely of proteins that form a protective barrier. And they form a protective barrier for the virus's genome. All viruses have a genome, and they can be made up of either DNA or RNA. And of that DNA or RNA, it can either present as double-stranded or single-stranded. So a double-stranded DNA or RNA molecule is going to look like that classic helix shape that we're very familiar with when we think about DNA. And then a single strand of either DNA or RNA is just going to be that single strand. So it's not going to have any, any helix attached to it. So that's just a general overview of what is in a virus. It is a protein coat. And inside that protein coat is a genome containing either DNA or RNA, and that DNA or RNA is either double-stranded or single-stranded. All right, so now that we learned a little bit generally about what viruses are and aren't, now let's get a little bit more into the specifics of HIV. So HIV is, stands for human immunodeficiency virus, so it's a virus that causes human, human immunodeficiency. Um, and it generally comes along with AIDS, which is acquired immunodeficiency. So because we have, someone has contracted that HIV virus, they now have a reduced immuno, immune system, and therefore they're much like, more likely to get diseases, and that diseases are much more likely to make them more sick than a normal person would. So generally, the lifespan of someone contracting HIV used to be regarded as very short. It was generally considered a death sentence. But nowadays we have developed therapeutics um, that have really re reduced that, that death sentence. And generally people can live a, a fairly normal lifespan with HIV because of the um, therapeutics that we have developed. However, it's been very hard for us to develop those therapies and we've had to continually evolve those therapies. And it's because generally viruses are very difficult to treat. Uh, for the cold and flu, you have to get a different flu shot every year because the Flu is always evolving. 
The same thing with COVID we're seeing now is that as we are trying to get the vaccine going, we are finding that we are needing to develop different therapeutics because the virus continues to change. So let's get a little bit more into why are viruses so difficult to treat? Why is it so hard to come up with treatments for it? There are two main reasons why viruses are very hard to treat. The first one being that viruses live in our own body cells. So unlike a bacteria that is inside your body, but is its own cell that can be targeted, viruses actually live in our cells. So it's very difficult to come up with a treatment that targets the virus without targeting the cells themselves. And it's not a very effective treatment if it kills the person while also killing the virus. So we had to come up with something that targeted specifically the virus in our own cells. And the second reason that it's very difficult to come up with a treatment is because viruses mutate a lot. Generally, we make therapies where we target specific aspects of the life cycle of a virus or particular characteristics of how a virus looks. But viruses tend to mutate and change a lot. So just like how every cell that replicates collects mutations, any genome that is replicating is going to collect mutations, the virus, because it replicates so frequently, tends to collect a lot more mutations than our normal body cells would. And so if, those, if the life cycle of the virus or if the way that the virus looks has changed, then generally we need to then alter our therapy to target the differences that now exist. So the mutation rate makes it very difficult to come up with treatment for it. So the first reason why viruses were very hard to treat was because they live in our own cells. So I wanna get a little bit into how viruses go about getting into our cells. So here we have a normal host cell. It has all of its organelles, everything that you would expect an animal cell to have. It has a nucleus and it has its genome, its DNA. So we also have here a virus particle that's trying to infect this cell. So the main ways that, the main steps that a virus takes to infect a cell is first it needs to insert its genome into the host cell. So it inserts its genome into the host cell. Then there is an enzyme, which is a type of protein called integrase. And that is what integrates the viral genome into the host DNA. So you can always notice an enzyme because it always ends in the word ase. And then generally the beginning of the word tells you what the enzyme's function is. So in this case, the word is integrase. So ase means that it's an enzyme in the integrate part tells us that it helps integrate the viral DNA into the host DNA. So it's going to integrate that little piece of viral DNA into the host DNA. So now the host cell does what a normal cell does and it reads its genome and it transcribes genes and translates genes. So in the process of doing that, it is also going to be transcribing the genes of the virus. And what that is going to tell the host cell to do is going to tell it to first make the protein coat of the virus. So inside the host cell is going to be made the protein coat. And then it is going to tell the host cell to insert the viral genome into that protein coat. And then the virus is going to burst out of that host cell and go on to infect other cells within that organism or to go on to infect other organisms. So it's gonna burst out of that cell. So now that we've kind of done an over general overview of how a virus would infect a cell, let's get into the more specifics of HIV. So if you remember, I told you that viruses can have either DNA or RNA, and that can be double-stranded or single-stranded. So in the case of HIV, they have a single-stranded RNA genome. So generally, the host cell's genome is made up of DNA, and RNA cannot integrate directly into DNA. So there has to be a new step where the RNA of the HIV is converted into DNA so that it can be properly integrated into the host genome. If we think of the normal flow of information in a cell, it goes from DNA where it gets transcribed into RNA and then translated into a protein. So the process of going from DNA to RNA is called transcription. So therefore we call the process of going from RNA to DNA reverse transcription. Reverse transcription is the process of going from RNA to DNA. And that is done by an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So again, we know it's an enzyme because it has that ase at the end 
and we know its function because of the rest of the beginning of the name. So reverse transcript. So it does reverse transcription. So it's an enzyme that's doing reverse transcription is called reverse transcriptase. So now when we look back to our HIV example infecting a host cell, there's an extra step that needs to take place. The HIV virus must first convert their RNA into DNA through the process of reverse transcription. And again, that is done by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. So now that reverse transcriptase enzyme has converted our RNA into DNA, then the enzyme integrase is going to integrate our HIV DNA inside. That is going to tell the host cell to create new protein coats and to fill that with the HIV genome and then for that to burst the cell. So now armed with the knowledge of how HIV goes about infecting a cell, we use that knowledge to develop treatments. So one of the first treatments that was developed is called AZT. So what they did was they took a normal nucleoside thiamidine and they converted into a nucleoside analog. So what that means is they altered the way that the thiamidine was a little bit. So they retained the standard structure of the thiamidine, which usually is supposed to have an OH group on the three prime end. This is what allows a chemical reaction to happen to attach the next nucleoside base. However, what they did is they created a nucleoside analog, AZT. And what that had was instead of having that OH group on the three prime end, it now had an N3 group. So now that means there is no reaction that can take place on this three prime end, and there can no longer be any bases added to that growing chain. So once AZT is added, that halts HIV production. So they used this drug for a while and it seemed to be working really well. It was helping treat HIV and helping reduce symptoms of HIV in individuals. So let's kind of go through several generations of an HIV virus to understand why AZT treatment started to lose some of its effectiveness and why they needed to start to explore other treatment options for HIV. So if you kind of look at just the generation time of a virus or of HIV, it's going to start doing its thing. It's going to replicate and it's going to begin spreading throughout the host cells um, or other organisms. So as it replicates, it's going, to it's going to collect mutations because any genome that is replicating is going to collect mutations. So let's say this one gets a blue mutation and then it's going to pass it on to all of its offspring. Um, let's say this one gets a, a red mutation over here. Uh, maybe this one gets a green mutation and it's going to pass it on to all of its offspring. So we can see some of them got mutations, some of them didn't get mutations, and they're all kind of different mutations. Most of these will do nothing to the, to the HIV. It's not going to affect the way that it looks, the way that it functions. It's going to have no effect. Some of them maybe would be a little bit negative to it, to the HIV, make it spread a little less well. And some of them maybe would make the HIV spread better. So what we're going to explore is the one mutation that happened, that happened to have given resistance to AZT. So we're going to call that the green mutation here. So we see there's a bunch of different mutations. There's a blue mutation, there's a red mutation, but those didn't really do anything that we were concerned about. They didn't affect the HIV in any way. But what this green mutation did was it gave the reverse transcriptase molecule better proofreading ability. So if we remember, the reverse transcriptase molecule is what converts the genome of HIV from RNA into DNA. So now when the reverse transcriptase is doing its thing, converting RNA into DNA, and we put it in the presence of AZT, it'll now be able to recognize that AZT is present and not use that base. It will know that that's not the correct base we need. We need the one that has the OH on the end and it will find that one instead. So now all of the HIV viruses that have this green mutation that give the reverse transcriptase that proofreading ability are gonna be able to continue to replicate even in the presence of AZT. So once we've added AZT treatment, we can see that the HIV viruses that have collected the mutation that helps it have better proofreading ability are going to continue to replicate because they're able to detect that AZT is present and say, that's a bad nucleoside base, let's find the correct one. 
But all of the other ones, the ones with the blue mutation, the one with the red mutation, the ones with no mutations, are not going to be able to tell that they're using AZT. And then once they add AZT into their growing chain, they won't be able to finish that replication. So only the green HIV that have that mutation that allow it to evade the AZT is going to continue to grow. And eventually that is going to be the only strain that is there because all of the other strains now won't be able to repl replicate with AZT present. A good real world example of this is COVID. So as we saw, the normal COVID variant was out and about. And then the Delta variant came along, which seemed to be able to transmit from person to person a little bit better than the normal COVID virus. And now after about a year of the Delta variant moving about, it is now the dominant strain of COVID. It is the most common strain that we see people infected with. And that is because it had an advantage in that it was able to move from person to person faster. So it spread faster than the other COVID variants and therefore it kind of took over and took hold. So that's the same thing that would happen here with the HIV. The one that has the resistance to ACT is going to be the one that's going to spread in the population the best. So the AZT treatment didn't work out so well, and they had to start establishing other treatments. So now what we use today is what we call a cocktail of drugs. So it's a variety of drugs taken at the same time that treats the HIV. And the reason we use a variety of different drugs at the same time is because we're trying to target the virus at all points of its, of its life cycle. So we're trying to, we, we would give you a therapy that would prevent the HIV from converting its RNA into DNA. And there would also be a drug that would prevent the HIV from injecting its DNA into the host cell. And there would also be a drug that would prevent it from integrating its DNA into the host DNA. And then maybe another therapeutic that would prevent it from making the protein coat inside the host cell. And then maybe another therapeutic that would prevent it from bursting open the, the host cell. And the reason that we do all of these things simultaneously is because it is very unlikely that a virus is going to collect enough mutations that it is going to be able to bypass all of these therapeutics simultaneously. So it's perhaps possible that it'll collect three mutations and it'll be able to convert its RNA into DNA and maybe insert it, its DNA into the host cell but it's not gonna have enough mutations that it's also gonna be able to integrate its DNA into the host and then create the pro co-protein and then to explode out of the cell. So it's very unlikely that the virus is gonna collect that many mutations. So therefore we throw the whole gambit of drugs at it that we can to stop the HIV in its tracks. Because if it is not able to pass its mutations on to the next generation, then that next generation can accumulate even more mutations to be able to evade even more things. So if we stop it in its tracks, it'll stop at the mutations that it has there and it won't be able to pass them on. The evolution of HIV to AZT is an example of evolution by natural selection. So there were a few things that we saw exemplified in that HIV AZT example that is required for evolution by natural selection to exist. The first one was variation. So if we think back to the um, evolution of the HIV virus, we saw that as it continued to go through its generations, it slowly accumulated mutations. Some of them accumulated different mutations. Some of them had blue mutations or a green mutation or a red mutation. And all of those are variations within the genome. So variations within the population of HIV. You can kind of think about it. The variation within a human population would be differences in eye color and differences in height. So variation within a trait is one of the things necessary for evolution by natural selection. But it's not necessary, it is not only that there is variation, there also must be heritability. So not only must there be variation within the trait, but that trait must also be heritable. It's not enough for someone to have variation in muscle mass from lifting weights because that's not something that's going to be passed down from generation to generation. If I work out my muscles, that does not mean I'm gonna have a jack kit. So no matter how much variation there is in muscle mass, that's not something that's going to evolve because it's not something that can be passed down from generation to generation. So there must be variation and heritability. So we saw that with the HIV example because once a virus acquired a mutation, it then passed that mutation on to its next generation. 
So the last thing that we saw that is needed for evolution by natural selection is non-random survival. So again, in the example we were watching the generation times of the HIV, we saw that certain mutations gave a survivability advantage to some of the HIV molecules. So in particular, the viruses that got the green mutation were able to survive even with AZT treatment because they now had that proofreading ability to allow them to not use that AZT and instead find the correct base. So there was a preference to which um, variation was going to survive best. So the variation, the green variation, was going to allow that virus to survive best. So when you have that non-random survival, when there's a reason why one survives over the other, and then you have variation in that trait, and that trait is heritable, then you are going to get evolution by natural selection, where the environment that the organism is living is going to impact which trait is going to become most abundant or least abundant. In the case of the HIV, we saw that the mutation that gave the HIV the ability to evade the AZT was the one that became the most prominent. And that's lecture two. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. And if you are struggling with any of the concepts that were taught here today, please make sure to visit biologybean.com where you can access all the tutoring that you need. Again, that's biologybean.com.